guests for this evening's uh, program. Welcome to Evenings of Stories, co-hosted by Alios Fawcett, Do Bengal, and Culture Monks, along with Masterpiece. Uh, uh, today, uh, we will have a talk by Dr. Janardhan Ghosh on the obliterated lady baths of Bengal. We are waiting for participants to join. Uh, there has been uh, plenty of uh, 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 registrations and I think that uh, in, an, in another five minutes time we can start. We'll give some time for others to join in. Uh, the audio access uh, has been granted to all the participants, but uh, has been kept on mute uh, during the talk. There will be a question-answer session at the end of the talk, and uh, you are most welcome to uh, join in a discussion with Dr. Janathan Ghosh. Uh, so we will wait for another five minutes. So by 5.10, we should be uh, ready to start. By that time, most of the uh, people would have come. In the meanwhile, I would request Dr. Janathan Ghosh to introduce himself uh, to all the guests. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you. And uh, I'm happy to see some familiar faces <laughs> amongst the participants. So I welcome you all uh, to this talk. Well, the introduction itself is a beginning. I don't know uh, how I would begin after the introduction. But um, uh, I should briefly tell you that this is a, a research that is I'm still into. I'm still exploring this world of storytelling. Uh, as uh, some of you already know that uh, we are into a process of developing a storytelling method known as Kothakoli. We are working uh, towards the developing of this particular art form along with uh, different other artists. It's a collaborative project through which we are trying to revive the uh, primordial art of storytelling. We are trying to uh, adopt things from the past and introduce modern technology and create a new form of telling. So in our Kathakuli uh, performances, we do have the usual narration, but along with the narration, like most other uh, ancient forms of storytelling, we use dance, music, uh, the performance, uh, acting, and also uh, multimedia presentation, uh, different uh, art installation, so that the entire experience is very immersive. That is what we are aiming to uh, actually achieve. So uh, that is what we are into. And in that process, while kind of doing research, I have been encountering a lot of, uh, of women storytellers from Bengal, extraordinary women storytellers. And so this is a brief talk about them, but also there is an introduction that I have understood about storytelling. And then we move into the details of these storytellers and what, hap what is the kind of socio-political situation? What was that there? And then how it changed, how it affected storytelling and what is the present scenario of storytelling? So in that, I am also going to um, uh, briefly introduce my personal experiences of collecting stories from different people, listening to different stories, uh, so that you get an overall idea of uh, what is the scene of uh, women storytellers here in Bengal. So I think uh, uh, we are um, almost like uh, ready for the talk. And so, Shudipto, uh, without much ado, if you would allow me, we can start the talk. Shudipto.
Uh, presently, I would just also like to uh, tell you that I'm associated with Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University, uh, where uh, I'm helping out as a research associate, apart from my teaching uh, responsibilities, I'm looking after the uh, research in the field of consciousness studies. And we are in collaboration with the, um, with the National Institute of Mental Health and Sciences, Bengaluru. We are working together and trying to find out how, and the, the, the area that I'm actually working in is how emotions uh, grow and what is, is there any kind of, you know, technology to measure the variations in emotions while you are listening to a story or while you are generating a story, uh, generating an emotion while telling a story. So what are the changes in your, uh, in your, in your neuro system? Uh, can that be measured or what are the parameters that we can find out to measure those aspects of it? So we are working towards that. So that is something that I'm doing with my university, but uh, along with culture monks and Oglam Bali, I'm working with Kothakuli. So uh, as Sudipto said, 510, we start off. So we will start off with a small prayer towards uh, Ramakrishna. Om Stapakaya Tadharmasya Saravadharma Sarupane Avatara Barishthaya Ramakrishnaya Te Namaha As you all know that we Bengalis never, we can never do without Tagore. And so I would uh, like to start with a Tagorean thought. What uh, Tagore is saying about um, his inner being, which is helping him to tell stories. There's a wonderful statement from Tagore. I'm just reading it out in Bangla, and then I'll definitely tell you uh, the meaning for those who don't understand Bangla. Amar antore ek birohi nari ache. She aponi kotha kohe. Onura, ura, mugdha, lujjita. All those Tagorean short stories that he is famous for, he says that all these stories and all that I tell or all that I have written, they are basically, there is a love lawn lady inside me who talks on her own and that emerges as my stories and this and he describes this lady and he says that this lady is anura very knowledgeable wise ura now ura is a word which i uh, actually thought ura is bosoms so is she very young beautiful well-breasted woman, or Ura also means one who can disguise. So is she kind of disguising, taking different, uh, you know, uh, wearing different masks? And then she is overwhelmed. She is uh, totally uh, bewitched by the wonder that she sees around herself. She's at the same time a little bit coy, a little bit abashed. And she is expressing. That is, Tagore is saying that that kind of a creature, that beautiful lady is inside me. Who is actually telling the story? It's not me. So somewhere I've seen scholars, they have discussed Tagore's androgyny. So is it that feminine being in Tagore who is actually telling the story? Is it that feminine self that is present in him who is telling story? What is he addressing? Or all of us, those who tell stories or those who have stories, basically it is that feminine sensitive self that actually tells the story. I think with this uh, wonderful introduction uh, to, this, um, uh, to this topic, would definitely, at the end of this discussion, we might come to know about this inner being, 
Is she a woman who actually tells the story? Maybe we might come to that. Uh, you know, we might able to resolve that uh, puzzle. Now, before uh, <clears throat> we move, uh, uh, I would just give you an overall uh, idea of how we are going to uh, the mapping of our talk today. So we would talk a little bit about storytelling origins. We will look into the scholarly landscape of uh, great of the scholars who had actually dealt with uh, um, storytelling in India and especially uh, lady female storytellers from Bengal. And then we would uh, specifically choose a couple of storytellers, women storytellers, describe their lives what is their background and uh, what kind of stories are they telling? And then definitely I would uh, discuss my personal encounters with a couple of storytellers, most of them my relatives. And then finally, I would read out a story. Mother. So uh, that reading would uh, end the end my talk. And then definitely we are going to have an open house where I would uh, uh, appreciate all of you to discuss things that I have just initiated. And as I, as a kind of uh, uh, disclaimer, I am saying that I'm still searching. I'm still looking for it. So halfway through the journey, I'm just giving you this presentation. As far as storytelling origins, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Vanita Kumar, uh, uh, Vanita Muthu Kumar, had been a great help. She had been uh, with me in one of these Kathakali workshops, and later on we had been discussing, and so I did gather some points from her too. Uh, so it is uh, definitely we all know. We have, uh, uh, if, if you look into different source books, if you look into our uh, different internet portals, you will find that uh, if we go for the origin of stories, the primordial storytellers who dwelt in these caves, the cave dwellers during the Paleolithic and Neolithic age, they had this urge of expressing themselves and they adopted different methods. And I think the first kind of telling that they had was visual storytelling. From the uh, famous uh, Altamira caves in Spain to the southern fr uh, French caves of uh, Chauvet and um, you know, Las Cox caves in France, that we get these evidences of cave dwellers, how they express themselves, how would they interpret their stories? Most of these stories were informative, instructive, because they would tell you what the, where the source of water is, or how this animal would behave, or what were the traits of this particular forest, what is there in the surrounding. So these issues would be interpreted through different uh, paintings on the cave. And that famous bison in Altamira is something that had been a real beginning of all discussions, all kind of cultural discussions, all kind of ex discussions about the expressive uh, aspect of human beings. We almost reach this point and then we start. It's like a flashback going to the bison and then kind of starting the journey. So you had uh, definitely when uh, Sao Tuvola uh, discovered this painting, he went through a lot of problem convincing people that how could such a wonderful and uh, uh, such, such strong colors could still be there without much of suit. And there were lots of questions that he had to face and a controversy did arise during that period. But later on, many other uh, discoveries of different cave paintings uh, proved the authenticity of this wonderful painting. And definitely in the uh, southern France, uh, in the southern France, the cave paintings that you see, they are, there are uh, short stories as if told in forms of murals. 
about rituals, about hunting. And this is around 30,000 BC, long back, primitive art of storytelling. Definitely, if we look at the Western history of storytelling, we definitely, uh, from there, we come to the Greeks. Because I feel that from just after this almost unspoke, uh, uh, unwritten, uh, unspoken, just the uh, visual, uh, uh, visual evidences of history, we move into something that is more concrete, is the Greek uh, evidences that we find. Uh, even about theater, if we, or, or maybe other rituals or, or any other um, uh, poetry writing, uh, literature, uh, politics, whatever, from the primordial time we come to a very strong juncture, and this is Greek history, which you all uh, must be knowing. And there is one famous, which we always often mention, is about the epics of Gilgamesh. And uh, it's a very famous story of a man meeting a wild man named, um, his name was uh, Iku, uh, Yukidu, Yukidu. And they, uh, they, they, they actually move on a journey for immortality. Uh, I think uh, these eternal journeys had been a great source of, uh, had been the great themes of most of our traditional stories, a uh, journey towards immortality, journey to find out the keys of immortality. Even when we discuss the Indian or the Eastern side of uh, our history, we will definitely encounter similar kind of motives. From the Greeks, we come to the French fairy tales and from fairy tales, oh, just before that, definitely we talk about another very persuasive storytelling that is with a, a storytelling with a particular goal. Storytelling which had the intentions set very well are the biblical stories, where the goals are almost fixed and they know uh, what these stories are meant for. So morality, uh, ethics, uh, uh, the, the different uh, kind of rules, norms of human lives were almost being uh, dictated through the stories, well being framed and evolved through stories and were percolated to the common people through stories. So after, I think, uh, these biblical stories, we have these range of um, you know, fairy tales coming from France, and then later on we see Grimm Brothers coming up with these wonderful collections. We see that. All these uh, different storytelling processes suddenly moved into a very, very technical sphere, and that is newspapers. This modern newspaper is around 1709. I think the first newspaper was uh, published sometime in the year 1690. So this 1709, when this modern newspaper came, I think stories entered this world of daily narrative reaching to the common people. And that is why we have our editors working on different stories. So everything they wanted to say became a story. And this has an essentially uh, a connection with that beginning of expression, that everything you say, even if it is very technical, even if it is very, very mundane information, if it is something that doesn't have the flowery words and take you in the world of fantasy, still it is a story. So whatever we, that is what uh, uh, Anita from the Michigan University had been saying, that whatever you do, whatever you say, she said is nothing but a story. So even a daily conversation is a kind of a story. So there, uh, from the newspapers, another very interesting invention changed the telling of the story and that was photography. Photography added a lot to our storytelling. Not only in newspapers, we know that then it moved into movies and uh, we saw it in cinema. 
that how that discovery or that invention in 1826 changed the art of storytelling. Collages made out of films or photographs telling in a more expressive way and allowing the seer to explore it independently without kind of confining it in the world of words. So photograph along with words as if expanded the world of storytelling. And then we know from photography, we, uh, then we usually got magazines and colorful comic books and storybooks with uh, different periodicals, journals with photographs. So all these things emerged and storytelling changed. We came to digital storytelling, contemporary time with the television, 1939. And then presently we are having a virtual world, virtual reality, almost 2018 we had. So almost it seems it's like a full circle. The storytelling that started with the visual storytelling in the caves almost returned back in our Instagrams and our Facebooks and our um, WhatsApp messages. So uh, uh, as if the art went through a complete circle and it has again begun a fresh um, journey. If you look at the Eastern uh, side of uh, storytelling, uh, then you will see that uh, um, I, I would kind of uh, discuss more when we, uh, in the next slide, when I have uh, the specific uh, women storytellers from the East, I would be discussing from the, uh, uh, from the ancient East. Uh, we will try to find out about them. But uh, in the East as well, we see that even in Natya Shastra, the first mention of the act is in a form of a narration. If you look at the story that is mentioned in Natya Shastra, it is a god who, a deva, who is resting after the, uh, after the kind of fighting that had happened in the daytime. It's in the evening when he's resting and is drinking soma rasa, having food, relaxing. He is narrating a story of a particular uh, act that had happened in the war field. He is talking about how brave he was in confronting this demon and how he actually beat him up and then how he chased that demon and the demon ran away. So that is the first narration that is mentioned in Natya Shastra by Bharata, where the devas are narrating the story of an act that has happened or an episode that has happened in the war field. And while this is being done, we see that the demons peep in and they find that they are being humiliated, they are being mocked at, and they are laughing at the things and some of them are not true also. So they really get angry and they attack the gods. The gods flee from there, goes to Indra, Indra takes a bamboo stick, chases the demons, thrashes them, and then he puts that bamboo stick uh, in the camp and says that here you can perform, you, here you can start your performance, and nobody will disturb you anymore. And that bamboo stick that is known as Jarjara, you must have heard about this Jarjara. So you see this narration is also there in the beginning of uh, performance. In Indian uh, uh, treatise on performance, we see that this narration is the first, uh, first uh, proof of uh, expressing oneself. So from there, we definitely come into different forms and we see uh, like Shutradhar, we see Stri Peksha, we see um, uh, different other performers like uh, Bharata. Bharata itself is like the actors. So we see the, these were the different uh, people who are mentioned in Natya Shastra, who were different forms of storytellers 
which are mentioned in Natya Shastra. Apart from the acting skills, apart from the different other aesthetic uh, uh, rasa theory and all that, these are cer certain um, uh, certain things that is mentioned in Natya Shastra. Definitely in Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, we find certain uh, and paintings of Ajanta Cave uh, uh, in different um, uh, sculptures in Sanchi, uh, in, in caves in Orissa, we find evidences of performers. Performers with different musical instruments, we see them uh, performing. So those performances were in forms expected were the forms of narration. So from there, we look into the uh, woman participation. Now, uh, generally, as if you ever uh, kind of do a research work and try to find out about women participants uh, who were storytellers, we do get uh, in the Indian uh, side, we do get a large number of uh, names. Definitely, there are a large number of names and there are certain evidences in different scriptures, different uh, ancient texts from where we find uh, mentions of women storytellers. Uh, we were definitely talking about that. But in the West, uh, as of now, uh, I have found this wonderful lady from the, um, a Latin Roman Christian poet, Faltonia Botilia Proba, circa 3000 AD. She is uh, considered to be one of the uh, uh, one of the greatest storyteller. And first, uh, uh, these are the early documents that we have about uh, her. Definitely, all of us do know about Shehrzade, and Shehrzade, which is uh, not a real character, but definitely it is a legendary character. But I wish to mention about this Arabian lady who is there in this storytelling of famous 1001 Arabian Nights. We all know about this famous story and she is the storyteller there. So a woman storyteller uh, depicted so strongly in, uh, uh, in a literature which belongs to 1100 and 1200. So these are certain, uh, similar to that in Bengal also, we have a collection done by uh, a research scholar, Dukhina Ranjan Mitra Majumdar, and that is Thakur Marjuli. But there also, Mr. Majumdar doesn't mention the name of the storytellers, but, she, but he actually uh, gives credit to an old lady who is actually telling these stories. And that's why she calls it the grandma's portly of stories, Thakur Marjuli which is almost similar to Shehrzada's uh, story of uh, this 1001 Arabian Nights. In the Italian Renaissance, we see Isota Nagarela, 1418 to 1466. Her famous dialogue in Adam and Eve is an evidence of early storytelling by women. Then definitely we come from there to contemporary storytellers like Harper Lee and uh, Atwood, uh, contemporary novelists and storytellers that we all are aware of. But definitely all throughout, we see that somewhere the women storytellers were uh, forgotten. They lost their relevances. They were somewhere washed down, they were not in the public domain. Similar things happened here in uh, Bengal too. If you see the huge uh, world of Bengali storytelling literature, printed literature, you will find only a very small portion that is uh, devoted to Bengali women uh, novelists and short story writers and that you will find it in the period when this uh, Bengali journal named Bharuti emerged and Bharuti was actually edited by um, Okhoi Choudhury and his wife Sharut Kumari Choudhury. 
they were contemporary to Tagore. You must have heard that the first novel written by the Bengali first female female novelist was Shornu Kumari Devi. You must have heard about her famous Deep Nirvan, and she was she also came up with an opera named Bosuntu Utshab in 1879, and uh, Shornu Kumari Devi's daughter wrote for Bharati. Shorola Devi, she wrote. And then uh, we have uh, Tagore. Shorno Kumari Devi was Tagore's elder sister. And then there was, uh, 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 there were other writers like uh, um, Madhuri Lata Devi, Indira Devi, Onurupa Devi, Nirupama Devi. They were all a part of this uh, journal, Bharati. So the Bharati actually encouraged a lot of women writers to write in Bengali. But if you see the mention of first in Bengali storyteller, it goes back, back in history during the Mughal periods, when there is this lady named Chandrabhuti Devi, who actually translates Ramayana and creates this Ramayana Gaan, Songs of Ramayana. And in that she, mentions about these storytellers. She says that uh, in, in, uh, in her writing, she has this wonderful couplet, which, uh, sorry, sorry, a wonderful couplet, which says, Upokatha shitarego shunai alapini hanukale ailo tothaigo kukua nanodimi. Now this, word alapini is termed as a woman storyteller the lady storyteller so chandrabhuti devi in the in the mughal period she writes this wonderful couplet which is a part of her ramayana gan where we find the mention of women storytellers for the first time so when i would be discussing bengal's uh, kothokotha later I would again address these issues. So women participation in storytelling had been very strong, but less documented, or rather it went uh, in, a, because of the social structure, the political, the, the, the patriarchal society, and we know the political uh, dominance of um, the male uh, different pockets that were there, which actually uh, did not allow the storytellers to come into the public domain and help them bloom this particular art. Another very interesting thing that I had noticed about, because women were generally told to take responsibilities of food, rearing the child, giving birth to the child, looking after the family. But later on, we see in many of these storytelling cultures where we see that food is being married with the telling of the story. There are many kind of traditional storytelling practices where having the food while kind of telling the story or after having the food, you tell the story. These are food getting associated with storytelling uh, helped uh, to kind of pave a way to enter this world of uh, women storytellers, where they would kind of take the initiative to explore this art of storytelling. Till date, we have this sub-Saharian uh, uh, um, African storytellers you must be knowing about, the griots. So the griots were these uh, very important storytellers who would actually offer education to the society. They would provide different important information to the society, to the clan, to the community. So it was an important act to attend a griot's performance. So every time after having dinner, the 
the, 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 the community would assemble to listen to those stories through which he would um, educate and entertain the community. Now, along with these griots, there were these uh, griotettes. The griotes were the, they had a lesser status. Of course, they had a lesser status, but they also got an opportunity to deliver stories or to have these, uh, to share their stories. And through their stories, they would also educate the society. And because they were the people who would serve the food, and it always happened that after serving the food, they would again take that role of griots. In another very um, Jewish community, there is this practice of Passover celebration. You must have heard of this Passover celebration, which, uh, and they have this storytelling uh, uh, ritual known as Sedat. And Sedar, it happens on the dining, in the dining space itself. So while you are having food, you listen to these stories, stories of exodus, they're moving from Egypt and coming. So while having food, you actually, ex and so we see many women storytellers participating in these kind of uh, storytelling performances. And uh, another very interesting aspect about Seda is, I must tell you, and that is, uh, you have these uh, uh, the the youngest, the youngest person in the audience would be allowed to ask four questions, and these four questions would actually trigger or give impetus to the storytelling. So this interaction between the audience and especially the youngest person his curiosity, his, uh, uh, his um, questions would basically initiate that storytelling. So that was, that, that's a very interesting ritual that is still practiced, that is there in this Passover celebration uh, in the Jewish uh, community. Um, similarly, I have seen that in our Bengali uh, community, uh, till near past, we had seen that our grandmothers, they would uh, tell stories while they would offer food to you. And the, 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 in smaller amounts, the, it's not the main meal, but definitely you would be munching on maybe uh, grams or maybe nuts uh, while you tell these stories. And if you have uh, read um, Devakaruni's uh, famous um, uh, novel, illusion of palaces, you would see that Draupadi is being, uh, being told stories by her dhaima, the lady who looks after her, who, and she also is into munching the food, preparing the food, sharing it with Draupadi and telling the story. So food and storytelling has a very interesting connection. Uh, recently uh, from Chandigarh, uh, this great um, theater uh, actor, uh, she, uh, she did a performance where she actually prepared a meal for the audience. And while preparing, she starts her story and then the food is, uh, the, the food is prepared and she serves the food and the story ends there. Like you have the food and uh, the story ends. So in contemporary performances also, we see practitioners, uh, they are using food as one of the tools to engage the audience in her storytelling. They are doing that. So in Bengali Kotha Kotha also, we will see that how uh, uh, food has been a very integral part of storytelling while we go. Now, as I said that I would discuss uh, the Indian aspect of storytelling where from the time of our Vedas, because generally when we uh, look into our um, any historical connections, we try to trace it back to Vedas. We try because uh, uh, beyond that, uh, we have very less uh, evidences because at least we have certain scriptures, we have certain 
uh, uh, artwork, we have uh, uh, different sculptures, uh, different kind of uh, uh, archaeological evidences are there, which is the pre-Vedic period uh, during the Harappan and the um, uh, Indus Valley Civilization, uh, Mohenjo-Daro period, and then definitely the Vedic period. Natya Shastra is a very, very essentially phenomenal treatise from where we get different information of Indian performance practice. In that, we find an exclusive chapter on women performers, women narrators. And they were known as Stri Preksha or Vadunataka Sangha. Stri Preksha. Preksha means to see. So, this Stri Preksha is something that uh, only women could see as if. Preksha means to see, stri means women. So women are seeing it. But uh, Bharata also mentions that it is not only that the women are only seeing it, even if men are seeing it, the performers are entirely women. That kind of entire women troupe of performers were known as the group of Vadhunataka Sangha. And these are, uh, 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 the, and they would be told to do minor dramas like Lashya or plays which would have songs and dance, which were known as Pushpa Gandhika. They were known as Pushpa Gandhika. And they were allowed, and they were the only performers who were allowed to perform in temples, in places inside the palace in residence of the merchants, there were male performers were not allowed in these spaces. So it was only the female performers who would be allowed in these spaces. And they would do very delicate type of plays. So you have this Dasha, 10 kinds of plays mentioned in Bharata, out of those Nataka, Prakarana, Bhana, Bithi and Anka. These were the ones which the women performers were allowed to do because they felt that they had this natural way of, um, of uh, creating the sentiments, especially erotic sentiments, were very natural in women. And even they had a stronger sense of tal and kala, the two. Tala is beats and Kala are the different kinds of emotional experience, uh, uh, experiences. Those different kinds of expressions, they were very good at it. So women were encouraged to do these kind of plays. So um, I'm so sorry. Just a minute. Let me fix the... Uh, okay. So... Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Uh, so you had these uh, women performers in these spaces, which are well mentioned in Bharata. And even later dramaturgs like uh, um, Sagaranandi and Nandi Keshwar, they spoke about this Cheshta Lankara of Naika. Means they have these natural moods of emotion. They have it very naturally in them. So they, these, uh, they also mention uh, in their texts about a lady named Usha, who was trained by, uh, Usha was actually the daughter of uh, uh, Banasura. And she was taught uh, taught last year by another women perform a uh, woman performer whose name was Parvati, and uh, Usha later taught this to the women of Shaurashtra. Shaurashtra, where actually uh, uh, earlier it was known as Dwarka, she used to teach them to the Dwarka, and from these women of Dwarka, the people of Shaurashtra got that word, uh, that performance style called Lashya. And this was almost like uh, the lineage of women performers. They were there. 
then uh, we have this Jain text where we see Mahavira going to a Chaitya in a place called Gunashalika. The name of the Chaitya is Gunashalika, where he is seeing a performance, uh, a, a telling of a story done by a woman named uh, Sri Devi. And Sri Devi performs in front of uh, uh, Mahavira. It is mentioned in Jain texts. We find Sri Preksha mentioned by later uh, scholars like Kautalya. Chanik Kautalya, in his, who is famous for his Arthashastra during the period of Chandragupta Maurya, he is also mentioning about Sri Preksha. He has, uh, he has mentioned uh, a lot about the rules and regulations for different kinds of performers. And in that particular uh, 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 in that particular chapter, he uh, talks about Stri Preksha, the women performers. So it, it, it continues, the, the practice continues. And as I said, that these are also evident in different kinds of paintings, like paintings in Ajanta. We see performers, women performers with drums and cymbals, and they are dancing and they are performing. Kalidasa in his famous book, Vikrama Urvarsiyana, he says, he, he, he has got a wonderful episode of a play performed by women performers, the nymphs. They are Urvashi and Menaka. They are performing a play which has been written by a women, uh, by a woman playwright, and that is uh, Saraswati. Saraswati writes it. And the story is the Swayambara of Lakshmi. So Lakshmi Swayambara is the performance written by Goddess Saraswati, performed by the nymphs of the heaven, Menaka and Urvashi. We find this written by Kalidasa in his famous novel. So even Harsha, in his famous Priyadarshani book, He's talking about a full-fledged performance by women. And that is uh, Udayana Charita of these three pictures. So our uh, kind of ancient history and the scriptures have ample evidences of women performers. Now, along with these women performers, definitely we have a huge information about storytellers. But those are basically main uh, uh, male storytellers. But the form of storytelling, there is a lot of variety in that. So I would just like to mention a little bit about that, which is mentioned in Rig Veda, which is mentioned in later uh, Brahmanas, in Puranas. You have uh, these uh, evidences where you have this art of storytelling. There is one uh, very interesting form of uh, uh, poem and recitation, which is known as uh, uh, recitation, which is known as gathas. And these gathas were actually performed by gathavids. And these gathavids, they knew how to sing the song and recite it. So this collection of recitative poems, which were also uh, known by as gathas were present uh, were, were known to these vedic aryans they know about they knew about it. so itihas purana the different um, uh, um, akhayanas they were all stories which were told by performers now a very interesting aspect of our famous ramayana is you must be knowing it that generally what we do is we tell a story of something that we can uh, imagine of or we tell a story of something that we have already seen it means we are, it has already happened and you are telling that story but ramayana is cla ramayana claims that it is actually the story comes first and the events happen later so a kind of a reality that emerges out of a story is a very interesting concept that we find in Ramayana. So as if the story gives birth to 
the different events later on. So that aspect of Ramayana intrigues me and uh, we never know that whether stories can be that very powerful, that it can give birth to events, to later events. So uh, that aspect of uh, Ramayana is something that I would definitely like to mention. And from Ramayana, I would like to come to the different folk forms. And one very popular folk form that you all know, and uh, you must have uh, seen also her performance, is Tijan Bai's performance, a very celebrated female storyteller from Chhattisgarh. And her performance, that is Pandavani. So it is from episodes of Mahabharata, and uh, different kinds of musical instruments that she uses while telling the story. Now, it is said that in Kathasarit Sagar, which is an earlier text, we find evidences of performers like Nanda, who is indulging into a storytelling which has musical instruments and dance accompanying his narration. So many consider that Pandavani is a kind of uh, a folk form of that practice that was there. So in the Pandavani performances, you must have seen that how she plays her instrument and how she narrates and sings and dances while she is telling different episodes from Mahabharata. Similar kind of thing you find in Assam that is known as Oja. Palli, Oja Palli. And in Oja Palli, instead of Ramayana, they talk about a serpent goddess, that is Manasha. But the form is almost the same. And you have this, you know, uh, performer playing the musical instrument. And also, they are, uh, 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 they are telling the story while they are dancing and singing. Then there are a large number of other episodes which are uh, like, you know, um, Tal Madale, Burakatha, then Kirtans. And we come to a very popular Bengali uh, uh, like form of storytelling, and that is Potu, Potuas, the Potuchitro. Potuchitro are scroll paintings, where scroll paintings, and this was uh, majorly done by the uh, the, the male participants, the male performers, they would have the entire narrative uh, drawn in different scenes uh, in, a, in, a, in a scroll. And while they would open the scrolls, they would sing and narrate the story. And that was, uh, uh, but Potuchitro, through time, Recently, I read an article by Rajeshwari Saha where she's saying that how women participants entered uh, this world of Potochitro because of the economic condition, because of, uh, um, because of certain kind of uh, uh, failure by the male participants, their lack of interest, their lack of involvement in that art, despite government uh, uh, influences these uh, Potochitro male artists did not, uh, uh, Potochitro male artists, they did not uh, uh, kind of um, put that effort. Whereas the women who initially thought it would be uh, something humiliating for their husbands if they would uh, do these Potochitro performances or do these spots drawn with, uh, or draw these uh, scrolls, it would be humiliating for their husbands. They thought that it is wrong to come out of their house to perform. So there were lots of social taboos that were actually stopping them. But because of these economic benefits that they could, uh, uh, they could uh, assume that that was flowing from the government sectors when they came to know about it, and there was a huge uh, customers from the West who would actually buy these photochitros and there was a huge market for them. Then we see a flood of women um, photochitro artists coming forward. And they took it to a greater height. Even contemporary uh, artists like, you know, uh, Gauri Chitrakar, 
from a, a, a village closer to Noya village. Noya village is somewhere where this kind of uh, work is being done. Now, we had been there and we've seen, uh, we've worked with them also. And we have, we have also done a Brechtian story uh, with these Potochitro artists, which we performed later here in Calcutta uh, in, Ox in the Oxford Bookstore Gallery. So we, we have worked with them and they adapt to contemporary stories, contemporary telling so easily uh, that we will also see when I'll be telling about these female artists that how prompt they are, how efficiently they could improvise, how they would continuously talk in rhymes. These were the kind of qualities that they had. So these potuas were basically uh, the, uh, we see the intervention of women storytellers here. So now if we look at, uh, now they were uh, different forms of uh, um, storytelling, folk storytelling that we had in India. Bengal had its own heritage of storytelling. And if we go uh, by the history, we see that uh, the oral storytelling, the evidences of oral storytelling is found after the Muslim, uh, the, the Muslim invasion of Bengal. And this Muslim invasion of Bengal took place around 1192 to 1202. But before that, through the sea routes, many Arabian merchants would come to Bengal and they would, uh, uh, they would learn the local language to do business. Along with them, they brought the Islam religion. They would also marry the local women, convert them, and would also uh, teach them different Sufi teachings. So this was a, a flux, there was a change. And uh, they were uh, going through these kind of cultural, um, uh, cultural transformation. What was the benefit of this change is because these uh, women initially, if we see during the Mughal period, they, uh, many of these women storytellers were employed by the kings, by the Mughal emperors. From Akbar to Aurangzeb, it is said that in even Jahangir in his own autobiography wrote about these women storytellers who would entertain him inside his palace. So for the queens and in the harems and for his personal entertainment, he would employ women storytellers. Even Akbar also is said to have women storytellers for his queens. So most of these women storytellers we find in these Mughal courts, especially in this Mughal uh, I would say the uh, the royal families, and they would entertain the queen, the princes, the princess, all of them. Even in Bengal, Ali Burdi Khan and Siraj Udullah, Siraj Udullah, they had um, uh, they had these uh, storytellers who would be uh, entertain them, and there is this wonderful uh, story of Mirzafar. So Siraj Udullah is 1756 to 57. Mirzafar and his son Miran story. Miran, Miran was a very, um, uh, it's said that he was very wicked and very cruel, but uh, he uh, would keep two storytellers with him to entertain him. And uh, in one such occasion, he took these storytellers to a forest camp. And Miran actually uh, uh, was hearing the stories when suddenly there was torrential rain and uh, lightning and thunder and thunder struck the camp, the, the tent, and Miran died along with the two storytellers. And it is mentioned in uh, their uh, book, very famous book, Ser Ul. Mutakhiram, Serul Mutakhiram. It is mentioned in that book, 17, uh, 1760. 
so uh, 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 so we see that the storytellers were there what happened is these storytellers suddenly were cornered by the rise of the brahmanical classes in bengal because the brahmanical classes they started detesting the type of stories that these ladies would tell because uh, the stories that these ladies would tell were um, stories of independent men and women going into uh, indulging into uh, um, you know illegitimate relationships relationships beyond the wedlock which was morally wrong for this class the elite brahmanical class and they started to uh, encroach these uh, public spheres where the storytellers or these storytellers who actually belonged to the lower echelons of the society and then started to push them away from the public domain and they would tell stories about gods and they would call them leelas so stories from ramayana mahabharata dhruva katha puranas those stories would be replaced those stories would replace stories of you know kings and queens the prince and the princess uh, different kinds of relationship between the common man and the woman and uh, uh, fairy tales they were all being pushed inside the room and there were these women muslim women storytellers because the hindus brahmins they dominated uh, so much that even the common hindu uh, people wouldn't indulge in such kind of stories and they started considering these stories as tales which are dirty malicious and they would call it kitcha kitchas are you know gossips which are malicious so these kathokotas or the kathoks the kathoks were the storytellers they now started having these the sacred thread and they tried to you know puritanize the entire story storytelling process and they would have all these stories which were from the different uh, sacred scriptures the common stories gradually lost got lost and uh, uh, so later on we find that uh, during this british period different scholars uh, different uh, connoisseurs of different uh, artworks they collected these stories from their maids the maids that the, the, the that that worked for them in their houses because along with the british military and the merchants many civilians many artists many tourists travelers they also came to india then and they were interested in this uh, rich culture of various kind painting storytelling and all and we find the first evidence of the first women storytellers named munia and dukhia Munia and Dukhia are the first storytellers that has been mentioned by a British lady named Maeve Stokes. Maeve Stokes, in her book published in the year 1879, she publishes a book called Indian Fairy Tales, where she mentions these two maids who is to work for her family. Means her father was uh, an officer. in the british uh, army and she uh, and they traveled and later from bengal they went to shimla these two maids also went with them and this lady actually collected tales from her then there was this uh, uh, bengali christian famous reverend lal bihari de who also uh, in his book named folk tales of bengal records stories told by another lady known as uh, uh, and he has said that uh, the lady's name is shombhu's ma means shombhu's mother means 
The lady's name is not there. Her son's name was Shombu. So in the book, it is named as Shombu's Ma. So Shombu's Ma is another interesting storyteller who provided with a lot of tales of Bengal, and she was a Bengali storyteller. Then there was another girl called Gonga. And uh, Gonga had learned stories from her uh, grandmother and relatives, and she lived somewhere close to Calcutta in a village. And later on, she, she also worked in a British uh, civilian's house. And um, then she, along with that family, she traveled to Bhopal and uh, stayed there with the family. There, she, uh, uh, she actually kind of met um, the officer, uh, the, the, the civilian's daughter named Miss Suzette M. Taylor. Suzette M. Taylor, she uh, wrote many uh, tales heard from Ganga and wrote about Ganga also in a journal that was published in London. And this was a folklore journal which belonged to the uh, London Folklore Society. And in the um, in uh, two volumes, I think she mentioned about Ganga and her stories. Uh, and as I told you earlier, that Dokkina Ranjan Mitra Mojundar had done an extensive research on folk story tales, and he had collected huge number of stories and had published in uh, various books. And one of the book is known as Thakurma Juli. Another book is known as Thakurdar Juli. There are other books also, but he never mentions about these storytellers from whom he collected these stories. So we don't get the evidence whether these stories were told by a woman or a man. But because he mentions Thakurma Juli, uh, somewhere we can definitely assume that maybe some of these storytellers were women storytellers the, in the huge collection that we have from um, uh, Dukhina Ranjun, uh, Mitra Majun. Then in Bangladesh, there is one famous uh, uh, research done by Dr. Ashraf Siddiqui, who was uh, the, the student of the famous, uh, you know, anthropologist and uh, connoisseur of stories, Dr. Uh, Dawson. And Dr. Dawson had done a great research on Red Indian storytelling and his own, but he was a student of that, uh, 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 that great scholar. And he has written a collection of stories known as Krishna Ganjo's Folk Tales. Krishna Ganjo is a place now in Bangladesh, uh, which was a part of the Greater Bengal, the Gouda Bengal. And um, he mentions about a famous storyteller in his book named Idan Bibi. So Idan Bibi is, uh, uh, is, is somebody who is uh, considered to be one of the famous storytellers of that period. So uh, with this, I think I've given a brief background of uh, um, different storytellers. Now, uh, th this is Muhammad Ayub Hussain, who has done an extensive research uh, on women storytellers, and he has got a wonderful collection. And fortunately, there is one story which I have heard from my grandmother, and later on, I found it in a printed book written by Hussain. Now he talks about a contemporary storytellers who had preserved these stories with them. So I will just talk about uh, three of them, uh, Jyotir Moi Mukhopadhyay and Rizia Bibi, which I came to know from Hussain. And later on, I, I met a wonderful, I would rather say I actually encountered this wonderful gentleman named Shamul Bera who has uh, been really working with, on folk, uh, uh, on Kothokotha, like the storytelling uh, practice in Bengal. And he uh, shared a wonderful story about uh, Bidut Lata Shamanto, who is still alive and is still uh, uh, in Bengal. She's in Midnapur. So I'll talk about a little about their storytelling and I would share one of their stories, which is common to the story that I've heard from my grandmother. So Jyotir Moi Mukhopadhyay is uh, from a, one, a very idyllic village from Murshidabad district. Uh, and in this district, um, <clears throat> there is a 
in there's a place uh, called Kathi, a uh, 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 Kandi. Sorry, not Kathi. Kathi is in Midnapur. Sorry. So in Murshidabad, there's a place called Kandi, and in this uh, Kandi uh, block, there is um, a village named Kogram. And uh, I'm fascinated with the name of the village as well, because Ko is the first um, consonant of the Bengali language. And Jyotirmoy Mukhopadhyay belongs to Ko, the Ko gram, the Ko gram. And uh, as I told you, uh, uh, very uh, wonderful flora and fauna there, uh, lovely lakes, um, uh, there, this... Uh, the Bhagirathi River flows beside the village. Uh, Jyotir Moy uh, Devi uh, used to live in that village. And Hussein has actually met Jyotir Moy Devi in the year 1969, when I was not even born, 1969. He actually met uh, Jyotir Moy Devi and collected a couple of stories from her. Uh, she... Uh, used to, uh, and, and it's a village in Kandi, you would still see that the, 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 the conflict between the Hindus and the Muslims is very less, like there is no conflict, things are a bit different now, but uh, when uh, Hussein was there uh, in Kandi, he said that the community was so um, cohabiting together, they were so friendly to each other, and they mingled so smoothly that it would seem to be one community. So Jyotir Moi Devi belonged to that community and she picked up these stories from her grandmother and uh, from the maternal side and the patern paternal side as well. And they had heard it from different uh, other storytellers from her period. She uh, used to tell these stories to, because later on these public performances were not there. So she would generally tell these stories to her uh, own children and later on to her grandchildren and that is how she actually preserved those stories and fortunately uh, it was uh, Muhammad Bhai who could kind of you know go and collect it and get it in printed form so that we can read it now. It is same with Rizia Bibi who is from uh, another district known as Bordhuman. In Bordhuman there is a very famous place called Katoa where uh, uh, in a village named East Noyapara, Rizia Bibi uh, lived there. And this particular thing was collected, this particular encounter happened in the year 1981, like uh, Hussein met Rizia Bibi in 1981. It was Hussein's wife who actually told about Rizia Bibi and then Hussein had uh, been to that village. Rizia Bibi used to play the dholak Dholak is an uh, instrument. It's a kind of a drum, Indian drum. You must have seen that both the sides you can play uh, like this. And she could play the Dholak and she used to sing uh, songs in different uh, events like marriage, like uh, uh, birth of the child uh, and many other festivities she used to sing songs. And at the same time, she used to kind of tell stories. And she was so talented that she could kind of continuously talk in rhymes. Like everything she would say would be rhymed. Every sentence would be rhymed with each other. So uh, this kind of um, uh, chora katha, katha in chora and chondo, is something that is extraordinary uh, talent of most of these early women. Even my grandmother used to do that, and she could do that but not continuously, but for a particular period of time, she could do that. So I saw, I heard about Rija Bibi who would continuously would do that. She was definitely, uh, uh, Hossein mentions that she, uh, uh, she believed in ghosts, she believed in uh, different supernatural beings, and uh, uh, she participated in different rituals. And uh, that's uh, her story. And so uh, we, Hussein could collect some of her uh, stories. So we do have these wonderful storytellers from Bengal. And she also collected stories from her uh, different relatives, uh, neighbors, uh, who would tell all these stories to her when she was young. And then later on, she would tell these stories to her friends. 
and then to her children and uh, would get less opportunity of to uh, to do any public performances because these stories were all those sketches those stories which were beyond the moral sphere that was drawn by the uh, you know the elite uh, class of this society so these stories but bidut uh, lota i'm sorry uh, it should be l a t a bidut lota shamanto had a totally different journey she uh, uh, adopted the uh, the 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 storytelling of the elite class and uh, uh, grew up but she had to fight battles she had to really really fight against many of the difficulties um, uh, and she had herself written and shamulda shamulbera uh, who is a school teacher and is passionate about kothokotha the art of storytelling uh, in bengal and uh, he uh, met uh, bidut lota uh, mohashaya and collected all uh, collected her life story and then got it printed also in a book in a journal she lives in a village named gorangpur uh, in purbo medinipur that's her uh you know maternal side that's her uh, parents uh, place uh, maternal parents place and uh, she uh, she loved listening to stories and she said that it was almost like meera bai that she got this talent of singing you know it is an innate quality of performance that was there in her she she didn't get any formal training of singing dancing and performing so it was there from her childhood and uh, she uh, uh, she tells that she had multiple names her uh, mother used to call her shona but because there was another man who had this name shona his aunt would call her as um uh, as 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 um, uh, kanu as kanu and then it was found that uh, her another aunt had uh, his uh, had her uh, husband's elder brother's name kanai so it is a practice it, it is the, it's a practice that you are not allowed to utter the name of your husband and the elder brother of your husband your father in law you are not allowed to actually utter these names so because kanai had some kind of commonality with kanu so she couldn't say that name so she again gave her another name called angur so bidut lata had three names but has three names so shona and kanu and uh, uh, and angur well this is something that she uh, told while uh, telling about herself uh, what uh, and then she also said that there was another name in her astrological documents and that was uh, dambukeshwari that, that was dambukeshwari and these astrological uh, astrological um, documents which are there are um, you know, these names are actually uh, the, the the scholars who would actually do some research in this and they would suggest you that you need to have a name with this particular uh, alphabet and it should contain those number of alphabets and thus she got that name so a lady with multiple names is bidut lata shamanto so bidut lata shamanto when she was young she uh, uh, she was in school she uh, actually how she said that it was very difficult for a girl like me to kind of really come out and uh, um, uh, actually uh, face the people but i got this strength from uh, the little acts that i used to do in my school that uh, people like sarojini naidu or padmaja naidu used to visit their school and she would actually garland these great people she would actually garland them so this practice of coming into the public domain was from there she said that she actually lost her inhibitions she lost her all the kind of blockages that she had like all other women during her period 
and in that village she because of this um, uh, this this little acts that she was indulged in uh, that that she was allowed to do in her school she could kind of get this uh, inhibitions she could shed these inhibitions now uh, during her childhood days she heard a famous uh, storyteller his name was anath bandhu adhikari anath bandhu adhikari used to tell stories of ramayan so as i told you jyotirmoy mukhopadhyay and rijia bb was a, a told stories that were kichhas but vidyut lata samanta comes into telling stories that are part of kathakatha which is like ramayana mahabharata so she heard this famous uh, storyteller named anath bandhu adhikari Anand Bandhu Adhikari is very famous, and most of us who has actually uh, done a little bit reading about storytelling and these kind of performers, if you know, she, he because he performed in the radio also, in Akash Bani Kolkata radio, he used to perform during different events, and we have heard him also. So he was that famous. At the age of twelve, Vidhut Lata got married, and then she shifted to her husband's. Uh, a village which was far off from that place and there she uh, she actually used to see some performances which were not as classy as uh, anant uh, bondhu adhikari's performance was but she would uh, she would remember that and she would have that aspiration of performance so she went to her mother in law and uh, asked that can she also perform and Uh, it was so kind of her that she said that uh, she also allowed her that you can do it but you can do it only in your house and so she used to perform and learn different uh, you know uh, different arts that were involved in that particular performance that is singing and uh, little gesticulations uh, oratory skills all these things she started learning from a priest who used to visit their house and his name was ganesh chakravarti he taught him uh, those uh, devotional songs like shama shrungit and many other songs and she was trained and often she would go and see her husband's plays her husband was a playwright folk playwright used to do yatra and uh, uh, different uh, village drama he was involved in village drama his name was devendranath shamanto so it was devendranath shamanto who one day brought a torn ramayana and gave it to vidyut lata vidyut lata from then onwards started training herself and she went on practicing her husband uh, she did not know the actual tonality or the Uh, or the kind of the musical rhythm that was required to uh, chant or um, you know read the ramayana or to perform the ramayana so she uh, took lessons from her husband so her husband uh, knew very little about it but still because he was into theater and drama she could teach all this to her and after that she actually encountered or met um anath bondhu adhikari in one of these performances and then husband and wife both kind of geared up uh, had some courage went to anath bondhu touched his feet and said that why don't you teach me a little i have already worked upon certain episodes of sita harun pala and sita's um, bonobash these were the kind of uh, uh, episodes that were written by her husband from ramayana so i have already practiced this so would you take me as a st uh, student but anand bondhu said that no you are a lady you cannot accompany me to different places it would be very difficult for you to travel with me you have a family so he could not uh, she could not continue being uh, his student but she would always consider herself to be an, an ekalavya like in your mind you have already accepted him as a guru even if he refused you you consider you continue uh, considering him to be your guru so she continued like that and then she became very popular and it so happened that uh, 
the day Anad Bandhu performed in the radio, we have uh, Bidut Lata performing just after that. In places where Anad Bandhu performed, he heard day before Bidut Lata had come here and performed. And like this, it went on. And then Anad Bandhu, it struck Anad Bandhu so much, then he wrote a long letter to her and said that, uh, I'm so happy. Uh, I, it's uh, unfortunate that I could not provide you with the lessons, but you have taught yourself. You already had that art in you. And really kind of, I pray for you so that you become more popular. But uh, Bidut Lata again uh, told him that you are my guru. I have accepted you as my guru because you have inspired me. I've learned from the renditions that I've heard from you. That I, I, you were my inspiration. Uh, you have taught me. So, so this is the story of Vidyut Lata Shamanto. She still performs, but now she is old and uh, she would uh, rarely kind of, you know, uh, do public shows, but she's very famous. She has a cassette of her own uh, that has been uh, made by Gathani. Gathani has made her uh, cassettes. Uh, now, what uh, I think we have, I have already kind of, you know, discussed uh, different storytellers. And now I would just a little bit, I will talk about my personal encounters and then move into the story. I'll read what a portion of that story because uh, uh, I think there's a short of time. It's already 6.30. And um, uh, I have personally uh, met many storytellers. And uh, one of the extraordinary storyteller amongst them is Panchi Baladasi. And Panchi Baladasi is my grandmother. And they lived in Kushtia district. At the age of five, she got married to my grandfather, who was 12 then. And during that period, Tagore visited just after their marriage, maybe a month later, Tagore visited Kushtia. And uh, uh, somehow, I'm not much aware of how, but Tagore met my uh, grandfather's uh, parents and said that I would like to take these two children to um, Vishwabharati and then, you know, help them uh, understand the ways of life and teach them and educate them. My grandfather agreed. So along with my grandmother, my grandfather, like five years old grandmother, 12 years old grandfather, and my grandmother's uh, younger brother, who was around four, I think, they all three of them went to uh, uh, Shantiniketan in Vishwavarati. And uh, uh, then Vishwavarati was all being, uh, was in, uh, in the uh, kind of, you know, uh, what you call, was being constructed, was in formational stage. But unfortunately, what happened is they stayed there for some time, but my grandmother's mother couldn't accept it. And she felt that, uh, what is it that we lack, that we have to send our children to somebody else's place? They were good enough here, where we have enough food and we have enough uh, money and enough wealth to kind of take care of our children. Why should they go there? And she was very upset and she created ruckus in the family. And then my grandfather's father was forced to bring them back from there. So they couldn't complete there. But my uh, grandmother's younger brother stayed there and completed his education there. So when they came back, my grandmother adopted these qualities of listening to stories and uh, had these a uh, knack of telling stories and uh, learning stories. And from there, from Kushtia, she was, uh, she uh, collected a lot of stories. And when she traveled back to India and settled in Nodia district, 
and we were like my father and my uncles they were all born and then we were born and then we actually heard those stories from her and the way she I, I would just describe it how she would actually tell the story she would have her feet you know like stretched like this she would have beetle um, leaves with beetle nuts she would kind of chew them and she would offer us a little bit of puffed rice with, uh, you know, with mustard oil. We would munch on those um, muri. We call it muri. We'll munch those muris. And she would chew that beetle leaf and she would tell the story. And while telling these stories, moments were there where she would go into a singing mode. Even if they were not lyrical, even if they were not poetic, they were just narrations. She would sing, she would tell it in a singer song tone. And that was a very interesting tonality that she would create when she would tell those stories. And then finally, uh, while she, and she would also challenge us, you know, sometimes she would kind of, you know, tell half of the story. We'd go for our dinner. We would then sleep next day, same time in the evening. We would all gather and we'll tell her the story. And she would ask us questions. What did that, you know, the prince do? Or what was that man doing then? Where did I stop? She would ask us questions. And we would be, you know, very prompt in answering because we, are, we were all into, immersed into stories. That was the experience that I had with Panchibala Dasi. And today I'm going to kind of read a story that she had said. And later on, I have heard it from Mr. Hussain, and who had got it printed because he had collected the same story. There were a little bit of changes uh, from Jyotil Mohi Devi. Now, my uncle Madan Mohan, means Pachibala's younger son, was equally very talented. I think she, he, but he was also, he used to play a, 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 a two string instrument while he would tell these stories. So, while telling stories, he would sing. And he would, and you know, you uh, in the like in our uh, place in Nodia, we had these um, carts. The carts they used to kind of, you know, the garage of the carts were basically the uh, open area in front of her house. The carts would be parked there, and these were bullock carts. So these carts used to be uh, like this, a slanted uh, way they would be uh, stationed. So we used to sit at different places on this cart and the uncle would uh, sit maybe at the end, like where the yoke was, the kind of the yoke that the, the bulls used to, where the bulls were fixed during that, uh, in that portion, the uncle used to sit. And he, actually because he was heavy and we were all, you know, very light creatures. So we sat in all over the places and he would balance the cart there while sitting. And he would at times rock the cart. So it's like a seesaw. So the uncle would actually kind of, you know, move and the during the telling of the story. So, and apart from singing, the physical action, the different kind of uh, vocal uh, narration that he actually uh, adopted, he would uh, uh, deliver the stories. And I have heard Guru Angla's story from him many other Kajla Didi story from him, many of these famous stories, which I later located in Dokhina Ranjan Mitra Mojumdar's book. But my uncle, he never went to school. He never went to school. He couldn't read. And so uh, he could kind of collect, I, I guess he collected all these stories from different places. And maybe my grandmother was one of the sources. So, these were my early days of uh, encounter that I had with the storytellers. Later visits, I am not going to discuss much because these are male storytellers and one of them I'm really intrigued about that is Thakur Sri Ramakrishna. And uh, uh, he is considered to be an extraordinary storyteller because all these difficult philosophies that is uh, there in the Upanishads, there in Brahma Sutras, there in our Vedas, there in our Gita, he would actually deliver that same philosophy through a very simple narrative. And that is the magic 
of his narration. Very potent, strong, simple tale would explore the complex philosophy that is present in um, in, in 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 our scriptures, and uh, that is why he has a wonderful. There is a collection of his stories which has been done by Sri Ma Mohindranath Gupto, a famous scholar during his period, who was also his disciple. Uh, he collected all these stories and have uh, gifted us with this wonderful uh, book called Sri Sri Ramakrishna Kathamrita, which is a collection. His language, the rustic village language, had its own poetic quality. The way he would narrate the story, he would act them out. Even while telling a story, he would act the characters, how that lady moved. He would try to show that. These all descriptions are there. Even the language was so very raw and hard hitting that uh, it would penetrate very deeply. So uh, that's the another magical world of Ramakrishna, which we can discuss later. Uh, I think Shudipto, we can arrange something for that. And the other uh, research that I am also presently doing is on Chadar Badri, that is uh, tribal storytelling art with puppets. Here, the puppeteer, they belong to the, uh, uh, the, the tribal people from Purulia, uh, a little bit of um, a, that area of Jharkhand and uh, Bihar, some areas of Bihar, Jharkhand, Purulia and Bakula, these areas, we have these storytellers who would carry a box with puppets on a cycle and travel to different marketplaces, public places, villages, and tell stories by showing that same puppet. The stories would change, but it would be the same puppet. And even the movements were not very, you know, uh, different. They were of, because only one person who would play, uh, who would actually operate all those puppets. And uh, he had his, uh, these anklets, uh, on his feet, which would add music to his telling, but he would have different stories. The puppets would be the same, and the movements were, are also very common, but that's a very, you know, a, an art which is actually getting extinct. So we are trying to work and find more about it, more about the telling part of it, the, the, uh, the, the, even the themes that they would usually choose how they are adopting contemporary themes into such traditional methods. Those are certain things that we are researching on. So this is, uh, I think, what I had to share with you about uh, storytellers and specifically about women storytellers. And I have a, a, a short story by, um, uh, by Jyotir Moe Devi, uh, which I have also heard from Pachi Baladashi, my grandmother. And uh, I would tell you, uh, I, I'll just share a little bit of that story. I would uh, use Bangla and English and then it will be open house and we can uh, hear from you and we can further enrich the discussion uh, because I would love to hear uh, information that you all have so that I can also gather that from you. Thank you. So with this, I start the story of Sharul <clears> Tathurir <throat> Ketcha. এক গায়ের পাশ দিয়ে বয়ে গিয়েছে এক নদী নদীর ধারে এক বড় বটগাছ বটগাছের পাশ দিয়ে আর নদীর দিকে চলে গেছে এক সড়ক সো আ ভিলেজ বিসাইড আ রিভার এন্ড আ পিপল ট্রি এন্ড দ্য রিভার ফ্লোজ বিসাইড দ্য রিভার देयर इज अ রোড the village lake in this village there was this village head every evening he would uh, come and sit under the tree the people tree and wait and when other people would uh, gather they would all say headman we want to hear and headman in bangla is morol morol we want to hear a story from you please tell us a story 
please tell us a story. And then Morul would suddenly break into raptures. Munjar bhalo ore pai shona Bisher ladu ke molo chor chodda jona Bashke ye more galo bagu huno bir Ghore shade pait gale che Amar monchai sti Ami kanchi chande bande Tumra kancho karsham bande Ami kanchi chande bande Tumra kancho karsham bande Karma rakar kande yogo, karma rake kande, karma rake kande. After singing this song, Murul would ask, Go on, tell me, what is the meaning of this, you know, this song that I have just sung? Tell me, what is the meaning? And they would say, oh, we don't know, oh, we don't know. So please tell us what is the meaning. And then the morol would start a story. And he would say that there was this woodcutter. A woodcutter who had a beautiful wife. Yes. Young, beautiful, taut wife. Nitol in Bang. Jovan So there are waves of youth in her body flowing. And they had a small hut with two rooms. I was just telling this story and um, so what happened is um, Uh, let us wrap it here because there is some technical problem. I don't know what. Uh, and uh, so this is the form of the story. I wanted to give a flavor 
uh, that how these stories are told. And uh, this is a story where this uh, woman who was very beautiful falls in love with another headman of another village and how uh, the husband comes to know about it and uh, how this uh, the, the, the headman dies and then uh, later on how the dead bodies are carried by someone else. So in the, uh, in the poem, actually in the song, it was that it was someone's, the, the poem, the, I would just uh, clarify that, that one whose heart is made out of pure gold, he misses the uh, poisonous sweet because this poisonous sweet was actually provided to the woodcutter by his wife. Uh, because the headman had, uh, you know, plotted with the wife and they had said that, okay, we need to kill this woodcutter so that both of us can marry and live together. So, um, so she actually made these poisonous laddus. But here it is said, Munjar bhalo pore pai shona. Once whose heart is good, is of pure gold, receives gold at the end of the uh, uh, story. So we see that the, uh, the, the, the woodcutter at the end of the story receives gold that was actually uh, stolen by some thieves and they had uh, um, stored it uh, in that forest. But the thieves died because they ate those poisonous laddus. And uh, then it is says, So the poisonous laddu was eaten by those uh, thieves and they died. And then uh, there is a, a place where a tiger comes and attacks that uh, uh, the, the woodcutter. But he dies because in fear, he was up on the tree and he was shivering. And uh, because of his uh, fear, the, uh, the axe fell and it fell on the tiger's head and the tiger died. So, Bashke Moregalo, Bag Hunobi. Even tiger died because he was hit by that bamboo stick of that axe. So that uh, headman who had secretly been to their house and was, uh, you know, um, uh, was, you know, with the with his wife. When the woodcutter returned, he. Uh, was scared and he ran into the other room and in the other room the bull was there the blind bull who actually hit the um, the, the, the headman with his with the horns and so he died so it is a ghorej shade pet geleche amar mon chai sti ami kamchi chonde bonde so this uh, uh, the lady who is crying is not actually his wife and uh, but still he is crying because of the death of the headman because they were in love. So here uh, and then there is another part of the story where the dead body of that headman is being carried by some some merchants who thought that he is a fellow merchant who was whose dead body was lying there, and so they carried this. So basically, this would have been carried by his sons, but instead of that, the dead is being carried by someone else. So this is a kind of a puzzle which is there in the song and he tells the entire story and clarifies that at the end of the story. So this is um, what I had to share today. Uh, the process is on. Thank you for being such wonderful audience and uh, uh, listening to me. I'm really grateful. I'd be uh, enriched if you all, uh, you know, provide me with more information about uh, storytellers thank you all take care uh, we can uh, shudipto we can have an open house and we can listen to all thank you So, Shudipto, is he there? Shudipto, I'm not very sure. Or uh, Sumit or Gaurav. Uh, from Strategy Academy. Yeah, I, hello. Yes, Sumit. 
Yeah, I think uh, uh, Mr. Shudipto is not there. Okay, okay. So I think I, if you have anything to share, you can definitely uh, share it now, or you can later on write to us. You have our um, Culture Monks uh, um, ID with you, so you can definitely write to us. We can share further, we can discuss, and we can explore this wonderful art of storytelling. And uh, I think many there are contemporary practitioners also from Calcutta who are there uh, in storytelling. Like we have Priyanka, we have Vanita from Bombay, uh, whom I know. Um, uh, Amrita is also there. So uh, it's great. Sanjukta is there. Uh, uh, and so all of them are uh, still into this practice and they are developing new methods. Uh, to enrich this art, so I with uh, so so should we call it a day if uh, if we don't have anything to share and wait for the responses as and when you feel like. Uh, is it okay? Okay, so uh, I think uh, Sumit. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. So Sumit, I think we can uh, call it a day. Uh, once again, thank you, everyone. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, would it be possible for you to share your email ID? Because I'm